Recording in progress. I guess most of the guys are back. Uh, shall we start or shall we wait for the other participants to join? I think we should wait for the others. Uh, two days, Thursday, sir. We 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 are our wicket in, in here in Saudi Arabia. So <laughs> our families are waiting. Please <laughs> uh, start it. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Better, he didn't give us a chance even for a haircut. <laughs> what about me? <laughs> <laughs> I saw you today in the morning in the class training for our people. Yeah, on Saturday we'll see each other physically. Inshallah. Uh, Mr. Badr, uh, can I speak? Uh, yeah, yeah, why not? Uh, uh, see, but uh, you have shown some risk assessment uh, uh, bubbles in, in the bubbles written in the risk assessment form. That, uh, in the in the book I got it. I uh, in which page you said they, because it is not uh, six dash twenty eight. Six dash twenty eight.
I guess we should start now. It should be in the IGC new syllabus or uh... IG2, IG2, IGC2. Okay, so so it is uh, came generated today. The book, uh, you, you mean attachment, uh, you, we got it today? No, uh, I guess uh, the book had been shared in the group. Can someone please share, reshare the book to Mr. Vijay? Okay, this is you shared in the uh, in the group. Yeah. Not not the not the one that. Uh, they yeah, yeah, this is the book. Yeah, it is the book. Yeah. Oh, one second, one second. Okay, it is separate book then. Yeah. Okay, well, guys, now we are going to discuss about the assessment of health risks. And uh, don't worry, just like you guys, I am also human having family over here. And I'm also having my weekend. So, of course, but we have to move fast. Okay, uh, now there is a group exercise. Group exercise is basically uh, how can a chemical or biological organism enter into the body? Which is the highest risk route of entry and why? What do you think? Guys, first, how chemical or biological agent can get enter into your body? Through uh, nose, mouth. Through nose, mouth, okay. Eyes. Eyes. I don't know, it's ears. It's completely gone. Okay, what else? Come on. Open wound or injury. Open wound or injury, yes. Uh, okay. Skin. Yeah, skin and some kind of injection, but injection is artificial way. Naturally, yes, these are the ways. And which is the highest risk route of entry and why? Uh, no, it's because directly to the chest. Yeah, exactly. This is inhaling, sir, I think. So. Inhaling, yes, because it will go directly into your lungs. So over here, we are having the same what you just have mentioned, inhalation. We can inhale just all kind of particles, respirable dust, only smaller particles, we can inhale them. Ingestion, if you are eating something and it, the dust settles upon it and you eat, then absorption through the skin and injection through the skin, like needle, skill, uh, needle stick, cuts and graze bites. For example, if some animal is going to bite you in that way, these agents can get into your body. Next is uh, uh, what is our defense mechanism? We are having basically two kind of uh, main defense mechanism to fight uh, the attack by biological agents and damage by chemical. One is cellular, that is your internal defense in which your cell fight bacteria and other toxins from blood, respiratory and ingestion uh, entry routes. Once some objects get into your body, your cells, they start fighting with the uh, microorganisms or the chemical. The next is superficial, that is external defense system in which you, uh, you protect yourself or protect against toxins that enter through the skin and contaminants in the nose and throat. So over here in the nose and throat, once you, once the, once you inhale something, the chemical gets into your body, okay, starting from here up to alveoli. Okay, you can you will be having sneeze reflex. So in case if the chemical gets into your body, initially you sneeze and the chemical gets out. Then filtration in the nasal cavity over here. Then mucociliary escalator over here. Okay, and uh, macrophages or phagocytes. It could be over here inside the lungs. And then inflammatory response. Inflammatory response would be once the lungs would be. Uh, somehow there would be some kind of inflammation and they would be converting uh, whatever the chemical would be, that would be converting it into fiber so that it can be absorbed. So we are having these kind of respiratory defense in our, uh, in our uh, system, respiratory defense, once we are inhaling uh, any kind of chemical or biological agents. Then the skin defenses are there. We are having first waterproof barrier, which is comprised of uh, outer layer, epidermis, inner layer, dermis. And uh, this is epidermis in front of you. This is dermis in front of you. And uh, in, in the defense mechanism, uh, 
it, in, it includes the replenish, uh, replenishment of dead cells. It means uh, recovery or the replacement of the dead cells, which are dead over here. Then sebum, that is basically biocidal property and a kind of waxy liquid produced over here. Okay, that basically starts covering your skin. And then again, if something is hit over there on the skin, it would be inflamed. Uh, inflammatory response, it would be giving it to you so that it can recover itself after some time. So in this way, we are having our, uh, our defense system internally and externally. This is your internal, you can say, and this is your external, you can say. Over here, we are going to do the assessment of the health risk. The same terminologies we are going to use, the health, uh, uh, the risk assessment, which we learned in our uh, IG1 in our uh, book one, what was that? That was basically identification of the hazard, right? Identification of the hazard. By the way, who will be telling me about the uh, five steps of the risk assessment? Come on, guys. Identification of hazards, mm -hmm. control measures, and identify who might be harmed and how. Yeah, how. Then evaluate then, the risk. Evaluate the risk, uh, control measures. And define the control identify measures. Identify the hazards, identify the people who might be harmed, evaluate the risk, record significant, uh, significant review. Uh, findings and then review. Yes, these are all over here. We will be identifying the hazardous substances present and the people who might potentially be exposed. For that purpose, we'll be gathering information about the substance. We'll be evaluating the health risk. We'll be identifying any control measures if needed, and then we are going to implement that control measure. Okay, after that, we will be recording the assessment and action taken, which we call significant findings. And then finally, the review. We'll be reviewing the whole risk assessment. In case if we are going for the risk assessment, we have to, as we mentioned, we have to identify the hazard. First of all, hazard, we need to know the hazardous nature of the substance, that what is the hazardous nature of the substance. If we talk about uh, hazardous nature means, is it toxic, is it corrosive, is it carcinogenic? We'll be uh, learning about it, we'll identify about it. Then potential ill health effects, how it is going to uh, give you harm. Okay, just like we know who might be harmed and how. Okay, how it is going to give you harm, some kind of ill health, very serious, uh, acute, chronical. Then physical form of that particular chemical, routes of entry through which it is going to get into the body, quantity, how much the chemical is going to get into the body. Then concentration of the uh, chemical, uh, number of people who are going to get exposed with that particular chemical in that particular area frequency of exposure, how many times you're going in that region, then getting out, going in, then getting out. Duration of exposure, what is the duration of exposure? Once you get in over there, for how long you will stay over there? And then finally, the control measures, that what are the control measures you are going to define over there, how we can protect ourselves. So in this way, we'll be having the health uh, risk assessment. Next is, in case if you are going to get the information about any chemical, what are the three main factors, terminologies, or what are the three main sources of information from where we are going to get information about that chemical? One is product label. But whenever you are purchasing anything, it comes with on product label. Okay, of course, the chemicals, biological agents, which we are having on our site, we are having the product label up on them. And if you don't have, your uh, client will come and they will start asking you, they will be knocking your head to put the label over there. What kind of chemical is that? And then the next is a relevant guidance notes, for example, occupational exposure limits are there, which are identifying, which are telling us that what is PEL, STEL, IDLH, what are these? We'll be learning about them. Then safety data sheets for the substance which we call them material safety data sheets. We'll be, learn, we'll be learning about them. Now, regarding all these, what are all these? Let us learn. First of all, product label. What is product label? In the product label, we will be knowing, product label would be like this. Product label would be like this. Okay. 
in which we would be having the name of the substance or the mixture, whatever the mixture or the substance or the chemical it contains. What are the hazardous components? Okay, the risk phrases indicating danger over here on the pictogram. Okay, over here, danger. What kind of danger is that? Okay, then precautions. What are the precautions? It would be mentioned over here and detail of the supplier, which is as you can see over here. Over here, we are having. Okay, so if the chemical is hazardous, of course, all these things are over there and in the picture that which is displayed in front of you, you can have all these things over there. Next is, okay, guidance documents. Guidance documents from where we are going to get the guidance document, of course, from some kind of legal resources on which we can trust. Do you remember when we were discussing IG1, we discussed some sources of information. What were those sources of information? From OSHA, from hse.gov.uk, then WorkSafe BC. Okay, so in from there we can get the information the same way we are having some guidance notes, like one of them is HSE guidance note EH40 which sets basically UK legal workplace exposure limits for wells and uh, occupational exposure limit basically this OEL or WEL both are same and we'll see that PEL is also same like this what are these we will see and then maximum concentration of airborne substance a human can inhale at workplace on in one day if we are having H2S over there if we are having carbon monoxide over there how much H2S you can inhale when you are performing your job for eight day for eight hours of time period how much h2s you can inhale or what is the quantity of h2s or what is the quantity of carbon monoxide you can inhale so this is about the maximum concentration of airborne substance a human can inhale at workplace then second second guidance document is european list of indicative limit values these uh, these are basically legal limit values for only for 19 chemical agents only 19 how many chemicals do we have uh, on our job sites? Just can someone tell me how many chemical? Mr. Umar, you are, mashallah, the project manager. Uh, how many chemicals you are having? Well, I have a huge because we have uh, many see, type of courses. Yeah. See, so listen the answer of Mr. Umar. Huge. He even doesn't know that how many chemicals they are having in the same way. We don't know how many chemicals we are using on our job site. Sometimes you, you once you call a new contractor, he perhaps to perform the same job he would be having or he would be uh, bringing a new chemical to do the same job, a new adhesive. How many chemicals, how many types of adhesives we are having, which we are using to bind the uh, things with each other. Even these are uncountable. Everyone is having different chemistry. Over here, we are having the legal limit values only for 19 chemicals. And this is, by the way, uh, if you see it, it's a big disaster. How we will see that? Then the next is American Conference of uh, Government uh, Industrial Hygienist, ACGIH, which defines the threshold limit value, the maximum limit value for that particular, uh, you can say day or that particular chemical, the maximum amount. It, remember it represent guidelines not legal standard regarding this threshold limit value it only give you guidelines because everyone is having different receptivity on average base we can talk about that we can give the guideline yes this is harmful but how much harmful is that we don't know okay so that that is why these are just the guidelines person to per person effect varies so these are the guidance documents which are somehow guiding you if we are having the harmful chemicals okay next is the safety data sheet what is the safety data sheet material safety data sheet commonly we call it msds okay safety data sheet basically outlines the type of information you would need to know about a domestic weed killer in order to um, guys this was a group exercise i missed that Sorry, leave it, early, early. Safety data sheet is basically some kind of document. In that document, we are having basically 16 sections as it is mentioned over here. This is a legal document. Based on this document, you can take necessary precautions, 
necessary uh, control measures whatever is required this document is basically made by or prepared by the manufacturer who manufacture the manufacturer the one who is manufacturing the chemical okay in this chemical you will be having and the standard standard one is 16 in this chemical you will be having the information from the manufacturer up to the end user who is end user v what kind of information is mentioned over here you will see identification of substance and supplier okay it would be mentioned over there hazard identification would be there composition of ingredients that is even you can see over here okay on the water bottles first aid measures in case if if while working with this chemical if it gets splashed into my eyes or if get if it get falls on my hand or on my face what kind of first aid is required firefighting measures in case if this chemical can get fire fire what kind of uh, fire extinguisher i am going to use in the same way if this chemical gets leaks on the uh, in the open area okay how we are going to uh control that what about occupational exposure limit if we get exposed with that what about the handling and storage of this chemical exposure control ppe what kind of ppes are required physical and chemical property of the uh, of that uh, chemical then stability and reactivity of that chemical if it falls up on somewhere it will evaporate it will stay there it will be reacting with something for example in in some chemicals or on some trucks on the highways you would have seen a diamond on the back side of uh, trucks with red blue yellow and white color okay that diamond would be containing some numbers what those numbers are in those numbers we are having the information almost the same information basically four four uh, different colors are explaining four different kind of information blue tells us about the health hazard red tells us about the flammability yellow instability or reactivity and white tells us about the special hazard so over there in white you would see that sometimes it is mentioned w and there is a line up there what does that mean that this chemical cannot be stored or cannot be put closer to water if there is o x and there is a line up over there it means that you cannot put this chemical closer to any kind of oxidizers because it can react with that and fire could be the result or oxidization process will be starting and that, next is toxicological information if it is toxic uh, if it is if this chemical is toxic in the same way ecological information disposal consideration transport information regulatory information and other if we are having some kind of uh, information which is missed up so as you can see from health safety environment transportation dealing first aid fire all the things all the uh, factors are mentioned over here the, all the information is given over there in the standard safety data sheet okay so these are the three sources of information which tell us about if the chemical is hazardous for us or not these are the three sources of information product label relevant guidelines or material safety data sheet or the safety data sheet in all the three sources of information there are some limitations what are those limitations first thing information sources provide general information only these are the general information okay which have been highlighted only as important okay and they do not allow for localized condition in which the substance are going to be used which affect the risk if we are going to use the oxidizer in humid environment there is no information only the mentioned you cannot use it in the with the water okay if we don't have physical water present over there but we are having it in the atmosphere then what we will be doing okay so it doesn't consider the specific or local condition of to be used then the information can be highly technical the information can be highly technical and therefore meaningless to the people who are 
not specialized in for example if you give material safety, safety data sheet to a labor what he will get from material safety data sheet because labor is the one who has to perform the painting operation over there okay then the next thing is individual susceptibility is not mentioned over there for example me i would be having different effect as compared to someone who is sitting next to me who is sitting next to me okay so we would be having different susceptibility different uh, reaction to the chemical and then mixed exposure cannot be uh, mixed mixed exposure uh, can is not defined over there for example if h2s we are having the information regarding h2s we are having the information about carbon monoxide what if both then both the gases are mixed and we inhale them what would be the effect on our body mixed exposure information is not given over there and it is based on the current knowledge only the current knowledge later on what would be reacting what oh, sorry what would be the outcome what we have to do in the in those scenarios these are not mentioned so based on the current knowledge in case for example if we are talking about water what about water as h2o what about d2o heavy water right so this information would be based on the current knowledge in case if we are having any other isotope same related to this chemical what will be happening what will be the effect on our body this is what we have to see then hazardous substance needs to be monitored okay it focuses on two factor one role of the hazardous substance monitoring limitation of hazardous substance monitoring what is the role what do you think what is the role of hazardous substance monitoring why do we monitor the hazardous substance come on guys if you are having h2s why do you need to monitor h2s on your job site if you are having carbon monoxide why do you need to monitor carbon monoxide on your job oh, site to take the action necessary these are uh, toxic gases because these are toxic gases we need to monitor them because we have to protect ourselves right so the same thing monitoring person like exposure to hazardous substances is sometimes necessary to quantify the concentration of a substance that a worker is potentially exposed to we need to know that if i am going to get exposed with that chemical how much i have inhaled already what about the chronic effect what about the acute effect for that purpose we are having different kind of dosimeters for different kind of electronic detectors or electronic meters like which we call them gas testers are there okay or sometimes we are wearing some kind of dosimeter in which once the worker moves in that area and can, and gets back after that he rely, uh, they are going to test the uh, dosimeter uh, you can say test the uh, scale yeah equipment that how much he would have inhaled based on that so these are different kind of uh, you can say scales on which we are basically monitoring and monitoring is important because we want to protect our employees next is monitoring might be appropriate in the following circumstances if you are going to monitor it then there there are some conditions what are those conditions when we are having failure or deterioration of controls can result in serious health effect when we are having some kind of uh, controls implemented for example a time was there when h2s was a leading cause uh, cause of death in the oil and gas field nowadays it's not why it was because we were having uncontrolled exposure nowadays we are having control but still we are teaching everyone who is going to the rig site who is going to the to work in the oil refinery uh, who is uh, running a plant or who is constructing a plant still we are teaching all those guys because it's a natural chemical okay so although we are having good control but in case if the control is going to get fail or if the if we know that control can get fail then of course we need to teach it we need to learn about it. we need to monitor about the about that particular chemical to ensure that occupational exposure limit for example well is not exceeded like for h2s 10 ppm is the maximum limit you can inhale for 8 hours in one day as per saudi as per aramco rules and regulation without fearing breathing apparatus you can inhale that and for 10 10 ppm sir, up to 10 ppm it's start uh, it's started uh, alarm na sir 
10 Sorry? ppm it's a maximum na sir adil 10 ppm is basically the threshold value it basically starts from 0 0.1 ppm you can say yes sir means if there is one particle of hos and it is going to be detected your alarm will start ringing yes sir okay so uh, i that is why i just mentioned 0 0.1 ppm means whenever we are having a minor composition of any gas in the atmosphere for example h2s our meters they are start going to give us some indications that we are having this toxic chemical in the atmosphere so we we are monitoring we are monitoring just to make sure that we are not exceeding the daily exposure limit okay if i can inhale 10 ppm maximum so i should not be inhaling 11 ppm next is to check the effectiveness of control measures whatever the control measures i have already implemented if these are effective or not next is after any change occur which could affect the control for example bad weather condition if storm sand storm or any any conditions are there after which we are having we think that our control measures are going to get affected then in that scenario we are going to in, in those scenarios we have to monitor the atmosphere or monitor the hazardous substance give me an excuse guys so these are the reasons we are monitoring the hazardous substance what are the limitation of monitoring hazardous substances first of all accuracy of result variation occurs time to time now it is 0 ppm after 10 minutes 1 ppm again 0 20 ppm again 10 8 7 like that variation occurs time to time because it's a let's say it's a gas it will come whenever it will come to the sensor only at that time it is going to be detected if it doesn't come to the sensor it is not going to be detected although it would be present over there so variation occurs time to time detection to detection then uh, variation in personal exposure if you are going over there then coming back going over there coming back perhaps you are going over there only for one minute and then and the value is 5 ppm being detected over there then in that scenario of course your your frequency would be different okay your habits and practices would be there uh, mean, mean of ha habits and practice uh, how many times you are going over there how many times you are coming back we are defining it for eight hours so if you go there only for five minutes and you get back then your time is still you can say your still time is remaining because you stayed over there only for five minutes still seven hours 55 minutes are remaining for you okay so it matters then absence of a standard not everything has a limit we i asked question from mr umar how many chemicals you are having what about their occupational exposure limit of course no one can memorize that we are having millions of chemicals sometimes even we don't know about the chemicals who will define about their limits as we just have discussed only 19 chemicals are those which are clearly defined about their limits what about other exposure routes monitoring focuses only by airborne chemical contaminants what about other routes of entry okay no one knows so these are the limitation of hazardous substances monitoring but still because this is the most dangerous one so we are we keep monitoring it and uh, through it because it's the easiest way to get inside our body for any chemical so that is why we keep monitoring this way and we usually use to protect ourselves so that that is the end of our module two and in module two what did we discuss just to give you the continuity i'll be moving back here we studied the assessment of health risk where we discussed how the chemical gets entered into our body what are the two defense system internal and external okay regarding our body and then what is the assessment of health risk how do we do that what are the factors we are considering what uh, how do we get the information about one chemical okay three different ways product label guidance documents are there and safety data sheets are there then we discussed about the limitation of information and the factors of monitoring the hazardous substances and uh, then we discussed that what are the limitation of monitoring hazardous substances 
so this is our module uh, two ended up now there is a time of one assignment today's first assignment huh? Today is 24 May. 25. Today is 25? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 25. Yes, sir. 25. Good. All right. So this is your assignment. Please, someone, please take a note and share it in the group. Okay, let us move further to our module 7.3 that is occupational exposure limit. What are the occupational exposure limits we are having? What are these? Guys, easy word, occupational exposure limit is clearly from the name. Once you are on the job, okay, you get exposed with one chemical, one particular chemical how much chemical you have inhaled you you took it inside your body what is the value that you can take it inside your body this is what we call occupational exposure limits okay we are going to talk about one dose of that chemical around the world there are different occupational exposure limits for hazardous substances there is no global standard every standard is having every legal body is providing their own standard how we will see that in the uk they are called workplace exposure limits if you are on the workplace and you get exposed with the chemical how much chemical you can get exposed you can inhale or you can for example take into your body we call it workplace exposure limit in uk they set a maximum limit of exposure that cannot be exceeded over a given period of time. Maximum limits are set, threshold limits, for example, 10 ppm. But 10 ppm does not mean that 10 ppm, okay, no problem. You, If it is 10 ppm, then you can stay there. If it is 9, you don't need to worry. If it is 1 ppm, you need to worry 10 ppm is the maximum limit from 1 ppm 2 ppm 3 ppm 4 5 6 7 you need to worry you must need to worry about this okay we will by the way discuss it then workplace exposure limits have legal status under kosh regulation what is kosh by the way control of substance as it is to health okay we'll see in later slides Definition of workplace exposure limit. What is that? The maximum concentration of an airborne substance when the substance is airborne, either it is gas or if you are sweeping and then it is becoming the airborne. If you are renovating and it is becoming airborne. So over here, it is all about liquid, solid, gas, even if you are spraying it how much chemical you can inhale in your body. So it is about that. The maximum concentration of an airborne substance averaged over a reference period, like eight hours or a reference period, whatever they are giving, we'll discuss 15 minutes, eight hours, 10 minutes, five minutes, to which employee may be exposed by inhalation. Means maximum concentration you can take inside your body over a specific period of time okay and you can take it through inhalation what are those basically two what are these first we call it a short term exposure limit or stell in which you can get exposed with some chemical or you are allowed to get yourself exposed with some chemical without wearing breathing apparatus okay stell for any chemical remember stell for any chemical is defined for 15 minutes 
okay what is the reason for limit you can fight with the acute effect of the of that chemical up to 15 minutes after that you cannot fight so what is mentioned over here combat acute effects at very high exposure for a short time up to 15 minutes you can somehow stay, uh, stay over there after 15 minutes no you cannot you will be a man down okay so this is 15 minutes still for any chemical then long term exposure limit or ltl usually or commonly we also call them pel permissible exposure limit in which you are permitted to stay there for a limited period of time that is 8 hours without wearing breathing apparatus okay over here we are having chronic effect immediately nothing will be happening but perhaps after 8 hours you will start feeling some problem inside your body okay so you can stay there up to 8 hours you can fight with that and uh, nothing will happen but before the end of 8th hour you have to leave you must leave that area next is the purpose of this time weighted averages these are basically time weighted averages because we are defining them with the reference of time a worker might be exposed to different levels of a hazardous substance throughout the working day different substances are there you can get exposed over there the stell prevent them being exposed to harmful level of the substance over short period of time where this would cause acute effects okay in case if you are going to get any acute effect stell will inform if you are having the stell value with you you will be informed that before you are going to get collapsed down you can leave that area in the same way if we get l tells okay that are going to be um, informing us that before we are going to get down we can leave that area our body would not be having any chronic effect so the same thing which we have discussed over here explanation is there now if we are defining about these about these exposure limits what are the limitation being below a limit does not prove if it is safe if it is defined for 10 ppm for example at 8 ppm it doesn't mean you are safe 7 ppm you are not safe 10 ppm is the maximum limit defined what about less than 10 ppm you are not safe okay it is second point it is only concerned with inhalation what about the other routes no worry no one knows for example in case of fresh us you start feeling burning eyes you start feeling sour or scratchy throat you are having pungent smell and you lose your sense of smell right so these are the things which are over there why it happens because some chemicals they are uh, other than toxicity they are acidic in nature so they are having the effect of their acidity with our body here we are just concerned with the inhalation what about the rest of the things next no account of individual sensitivity or susceptibility what about me my susceptibility would be different than you and your susceptibility would be different than someone else okay age gender your physical health it matters for that okay then no account of synergetic or combined effect we already discussed about that invalid if normal environmental conditions are getting changed if you are defining about it and there is a strong wind everything will remain will be invalid or if the wind is not moving over there of course with the time with the environment values will be changed then some limits do not consider all possible health effects of a substance only major one which are on average based can be seen or usually used to appear in the in the person or in a worker okay so these are the limitation what are the international standard over here we will see different international standard as you mentioned that there is no global standard so what are these first in uk we call it workplace exposure limit in europe we call it indicative limit values the same 
meaning is same okay but in both the standard we are having different name in us we are having so many names for example the american conference of governmental industrial hygienist acgih sets tlv threshold limit value the maximum limit value but about the rest nothing okay next the national institute of occupational safety and health in neosh recommends it as exposure limit uh, sorry uh, recommends it as recommended exposure limit rels okay then the american industrial hygiene association has developed a workplace in environment uh, workplace environmental exposure limit which we call wheels in the same way the osha the occupational safety and health administration enforces department of labor at permissible exposure limit which is pel which is very famous over here in saudi arabia so we are having with one i mean with let's say h2s 10 ppm for 10 ppm you can see how many names we are having wel ilb then tlv then uh, they are calling it rels wheels pels so these are diff these are different names and there is no global standard on which we can rely over there everyone is mentioning based on different experiment what they would have done right but overall what do we do in this scenario which one is more stringent we used to follow that which one is more strict we used to follow that so over here there is a end of module what are oels what are they known in the uk uh, what is the difference between it assignment will cover only question number 2 which is very important okay so i'll be mentioning it over here this is your assignment we already discussed it by the way so i want you guys to memorize this that is why i am giving you regarding the first one no worries but second one is important okay second question number 2 everyone must do it one important thing tomorrow is holiday inshallah i will be sending one excel sheet on which everyone's name would be mentioned that who submitted what assignment okay and if you would not have submitted then think about yourself what you are doing with yourself not i am because i will be submitting the same report as it is okay and i cannot make your assignments on your behalf and i cannot submit it over there so that is why remember this is your job you have to submit it you have to prepare it you have to submit it and on daily basis if you do it it's nothing by the way so yeah okay fine so this was the end of our module 7.3 in our 7.3 module what did we discuss in 7.3 we discussed the occupational exposure limits that we are having different standard in the world and for one thing that is the dose two of the main thing two of the main exposure limits we have discussed one is stel and one is eltel short term exposure limits or long term exposure limits and we have seen what are their limitations and what are their different names and different standard this is what we had discussed in our module 7.3 now 7.4 yes please someone has mentioned sir can you please share with me your email to submit assignment sir yadnan i didn't if i have not for all those who do not know my email address till now i guess now it is clear badar 646@gmail.com this is my email address for everyone now uh, we are going to discuss the control measures
Why do we have to discuss the control miles, by the way? Weekend guys, are you with me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, great. And, 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 and. Assignment is shared. Okay, fine. Yes, sir. Oh, Ronaldo also came. Very nice. Uh, okay, the, the need to prevent the control exposure. Of course, we need to prevent ourselves from getting exposed with the hazardous or harmful chemicals. Okay, remember prevention of exposure is the best. You prevent yourself, you protect yourself. If not possible to prevent the exposure, we try to control it adequately as much as possible. In, we must ensure that workplace exposure limited OELs are not exceeded. This is the only way in which we can protect ourselves. What will be the time of Salah? Because this module will be taking a little bit longer time. No issues, we'll, we'll still have time. Okay, so over here, uh, COSH regulation, control of substance hazardous to health regulation 2002. It is giving us some principle of good practice. If we practice these principle, okay, we can prevent our, we can protect ourselves. We can prevent, by the way, we can protect ourselves. What are these? First of all, minimize emission of any chemical, release and spread of hazardous substance. If we are having any hazardous substance, try to minimize its leak out, its exposure in the atmosphere, for example. Then consider that the route of exposure, how you are going to get exposed. Inhalation wa was the main one we discussed. Use control measures proportionate or appropriate to the risk. Whatever the risk is, as per the risk, use the control measure. Then choose effective and reliable control measures, which are defined by legal guideline or legal bodies and the guidelines would have been given use proper personal protective equipment where control cannot be achieved by other means in case you cannot control the substance then you have to use the ppe check control measures regularly review them inform and train the employees ensure new control measures do not increase overall risk for example you are uh, asking to use more PPE and the PPEs are not compatible with each other, then it would be useless. So we need to ensure new control measures do not increase our overall risk. Okay, so these are the principle of good practice. We are going to discuss on these one by one over here, the practical control of exposure. First of all, we'll be going for the elimination or substitution in which we will be discussing about the engineering control as well. For example, uh, first of all, we'll be going for the elimination or substitution. We can change the process. We can reduce the exposure time. We can enclose and segregate it, the chemical area. Okay, we can use the local exhaust ventilation just to pick the chemical and throw it out, throw it away from us. And we can use the dilution ventilation. What is that? We will see in example for dilution ventilation. Don't get confused. It would be just like this. Okay that natural ventilation would be there the next is personal hygiene and protection regimes for uh, this these are basically administrative control that what about your personal hygiene what about your protection changes over there then health surveillance must be conducted by the company then a respiratory protective equipment or any other kind of personal protective equipment so pp comes at the last starting from elimination, substitution, engineering control, administrative control, and then PPE. So first thing comes over here, elimination or substitution. Eliminate the process, for example, outsource painting. Okay, instead of you start performing the painting operation, ask someone to come and perform the painting operation. Usually when the third party come, they are having all the equipment and they can, they know how to protect themselves. Change, change work, for example, screw rather than glue if you are if you are applying the glue means you are using the chemical so don't use the glue try the screw we'll be having the metallic screws of course there is no hazardous substance then then dispose of unwanted stock whatever is not required dispose it off 
substitute hazardous from non hazardous for example irritant to non irritant uh, non hazardous floor cleaning or corrosive to irritant like simple way uh, acid to harpic we are going to change it in that way change physical form of substance to one that is less harmful if you are having a uh, gas try to bring something which is liquid if liquid try to bring something which is solid then in that way we are eliminating or we are substituting it process change apply a solvent by brush instead of spraying don't do the spray painting use the brush painting vacuum rather than sweep instead of uh, sweeping and making it airborne you can vacuum you can suck it in that way we are changing the process next is reducing the time exposure that how much time i'm going to get exposed with that chemical if i reduce that automatically i would be having less effect on my body double the time double the dose half the time half the dose reduce the time reduce your dose minimize the time period over which people are working with hazardous substance and that is basically linked to occupational exposure limits next is enclosure and segregation if we are having hazardous chemical we can enclose them totally enclose the substance prevent to ex uh, prevent uh, prevent access to it or prevent the people from getting access or uh, in in either way chemical can get come over there or the people can reach over there only the authorized people should be assigned to go over there and uh, and in extremely required way for example and then segregation keep people away designated areas should be defined so that we can segregate the people and uh, then local exhaust ventilation for example if you are dealing with some kind of chemical over here okay and uh, that chemical is be for example sub substance is there and like i give you the example if you if you go to any carpentry shop where we are having the wood wood work is going on you can smell and you can tell that if the wood work is going on over there or no okay so what we have to do even for wood work if we are smelling there means the chemical we are inhaling some kind of chemical maybe the wood dust okay what about the rest of the things as we mentioned in the we agreed by the way in the beginning that there are some things which are fumes what are fumes fumes are those particles which are directly converted from solid to gas form like welding fumes are there so for that purpose of course welder has to be over there to perform the welding operation and the process cannot be changed or eliminated if it is changed or eliminated for example you can go for auto welding okay go over there but sometimes it is not possible you have to do welding by yourself in those scenarios uh, what we do we use the local exhaust ventilation for example you are doing the job the exhaust hoods are adjustable you bring them over there and these hoods are basically sucking the air from here and taking it there into the pipes and being sent outside all kind of uh, hazardous substances okay and uh, dust would be collected over here and the structure you can see it's appearing over here in front of you guys there is one question discuss how the effectiveness of local exhaust ventilation may be reduced if we are using the local exhaust ventilation over here how its effectiveness may be reduced consider this picture okay maybe the hood is not adjusted properly over here so it is not able to suck properly perhaps let me discuss it point to point over here pro poorly positioned the intake hood this is what i mentioned perhaps it is not properly positioned next is damaged ducts the ducts which are taking it these ducts are damaged this duct might be damaged this duct might be damaged main duct might be damaged okay next is excessive amount of con contamination the contamination is too much that it will not be going over there perhaps it will leak out from the from the location from the spot it, it is going to be leaked out away uh, on either side in case if you are having other factors for example if you are having the air condition or if you are having 
uh, fans are already running over there so those can divert them then in effective fan or blog filters for example this fan is not effective for the fan which is placed over here initial plan over here or maybe over here or perhaps over here that would not be effective okay maybe there is a damage over here maybe there is a damage over here in the air filter okay then blind up of contaminants in the ducts uh, sorry build up of contaminants in the dust then sharp bends in the ducts over here if we are having sharp edge like this this these contaminants perhaps they will stay here in the duct and duct itself would be getting contaminated so that is why we don't have to make sharp bends we have to make circular bends over there then unauthorized addition to the system for example i know that whatever we put it over there it is going to be extracted and it is going to be thrown outside so i myself i am going to i am going to put something by myself over here i am going to break it and i am going to create some vacuum for my machine over here can i do that not possible of course only the authorized person can do that so if i do it by myself what will be happening simple that would be creating the ineffectiveness of this lev or local exhaust ventilation so these are some of the points which are basically affecting the local exhaust ventilation what we have to do we have to go for routine visual inspection for uh, for all these points okay we have to go for routine visual inspection so that we can check the integrity of the system for example to check the integrity of the filters contaminants if they are built up over there we need to clean clean the contaminants clean the ducts plant preventive maintenance shutdowns should be there replacing the filters lubricant fans uh, lubricating the fan bearing periodic testing could be there to ensure air velocities are adequate and there is no object stuck over there every 14 months as per coach requirement we need to clean them okay we need to test them we need to clean them so these are the ways we are making the local exhaust ventilation effective clear okay now there is something which we call dilution of ventilation okay A dilution of ventilation is what we do basically we dilute the contaminants how do we di dilute the contaminants by changing the air inside that for that for that way or for that purpose we are doing the passive dilution we are doing the active dilution in passive dilution what we do we make some kind of areas which can be vented but that would be made with the flow of air for example over here the flow of air will come from this side okay it will be going over there it will be getting out from here as you can see okay this is the example of passive dilution ventilation and usually we are having these in the area where we are having uh, for example chickens or some kind of animals are there uh, poultry farms we are having this over there usually and then used where well is high workplace exposure limit is high formation of gas or vapor is slow or uh, it is very low usually it does not appear over there usually it does not build up over there operators are not close to the contaminants you are going over there only for short time and you are getting outside and still it is a big area so of course uh, exposure limit would not be affecting much for you so we are using the passive dilution over there okay and uh, import important to know whether contaminants is lighter or heavier than air if if contaminants are heavier than air then passive dilution would not be working then we have to apply some kind of fans over there be then we will go with the positive ventilation or negative ventilation whatever you do you create vacuum or you push the air inside okay <clears throat> so in the in those ways we are basically diluting the uh, area and uh, this is what we call uh, dilution ventilation if there is any question from this dilution ventilation please let me know
no question guys give me only 2 to 3 3 minutes break okay and we will stay online only for 2 to 3 minutes i want to finish this topic before we go on break okay only 2 minutes huh i'll be staying online uh well guys uh, i'm back now uh we are going to discuss the uh, uh, till now what we have discussed if there is any question please ask me no anyone if you are alive and you are with me no sir no sir thank thank you for your feedback okay regarding the dilute uh, dilute ventilation or dilution ventilation what are the limitation first of all it is not suitable for highly toxic substances we already agreed that we are doing it for the areas where we are having uh, contamination not build up over there okay we are having this phenomena that contamination is not going to build up over there next is compromised uh, it can be compromised by sudden release of large quantity of contaminants for example if we are having any kind of contaminants come over here then there is no use of uh, of uh, this ventilation because we don't have any force to ventilate the space it would be ventilating naturally next is it is not working well for dust for point for point sources okay and where we are having dead areas 
okay or means where we are having very limited movement of air for example closer to these corners over here okay or over there if we are having dead areas there so in those areas it would not be working effectively next uh, there is a respiratory protective equipment we are having two types of respiratory protective equipment one of them is respirators in which filter contaminated the air from the atmosphere around the wearer once you are wearing that the air around you is going to be filtered out and you will be inhaling that you don't use any kind of artificial air in the breathing apparatus what do we do we are basically getting the breathable air from a separate source like cylinder we are getting it from that so we are going to discuss different <coughs> we are going to discuss different kind of respirators now their benefits and limitations you would have seen these kind of respirators what are the benefits these are cheap these are easy to use these are disposable one time you use it you dispose them off and in corona we have used it uh, what are the limitation it gives you low level of protection it doesn't seal against the face effectively okay it is generically made or you can seal yourself but it doesn't protect you proper sealing and uncomfortable to wear <clears throat> if you are not habitual to wear that of course it is not comfortable to wear and once you wear it of course you are having oxygen deficiency next is a half mask or ori nasal respirator these are those okay and uh, use and benefits are these are giving you good level of filtration of the air good fit could be achieved because it is having straps which can be adjusted as per your face okay and these are easy to use there uh, but what are the limitation no built in eye protection because this is half face negative pressure inside the face piece okay there is no positive pressure and then uncomfortable to wear because of this negative pressure next is full face respirator as you can see these are okay good level of filtration good fit achievable these are also protecting your eyes Res uh, limitations are it will be restricting your vision you can see to the front side but you cannot see to right or left okay negative pressure inside the face piece we already discussed what is the meaning of negative pressure and positive pressure and these are uncomfortable to wear then uh, these are the powered respirator powered respirator are those you can see over here okay where we are giving them some kind of power what are the benefits in intermediate level of filtration is there okay air movement cools the wearer because it is powered already air is being moved over there and air stream prevents inward leaks so in case if there is some kind of leak it would be prevented and you don't have to worry about that uh, because it is uh, powered so contaminants usually do not get enter in that uh, mask or in that face shield Uh, limitation these are heavy to wear no tight face shield and limited battery life once the battery get finished no protection is there next is a compressed air line or that is what we call saba supplied air breathing apparatuses okay what are the use and benefits a supply of air is not a time rest restricted if a compressor is used usually we are using the compressor and uh, even if we don't use a compressor we are having huge cylinders or a series of cylinder where you can have the breathing air for up to 8 hours 9 hours usually we are having it in so that in case if the compressor gets filled still you are having enough time as well as you are having a 5 minutes escape unit installed along that is mandatory by the way to use with this one it is already having the positive pressure inside the face uh, piece next is wearer is are not burdened with the cylinder cylinders are trolley mounted or it would be placed somewhere but you are having a long long hose with you the bad thing about it hose can be long but not endless 20 meter let's say but of course after 20 meter it would be getting end second important thing if a bend comes in the hose you would not be having any kind of air to breathe third important thing if there is a crack then you would then it would be ineffective and uh, 
uh, there is something which we call self contained breathing apparatus commonly people they call it scaba these are basically pressurized cylinder uh, and what are the benefits complete freedom of movement okay positive pressure inside the face piece what are the limitations supplied of air is time restricted it is not time restricted it is about the pressure of course the way you are breathing it depends okay equipment is bulky and heavy and hard to wear you can get the back injury even while you are wearing it and more technical training is required of course we are conducting the uh, i mean different areas you guys are having you guys would have attended different trainings regarding how to wear it using the coat method or overhead method we are having it so th these are different breathing apparatuses and their advantages and disadvantages now we are going to uh, understand the selection use and maintenance of respiratory protective equipment what are the factors we have to consider before we are going to select them use them of course advantages and disadvantages are first thing then important thing concentration of the contaminant and its hazard if concentration is less and you are not reaching to wel then you don't have to use the scba okay maybe a single simple mask would be protecting you what then next is what is the physical form of the substance liquid solid or gas we need to consider before you are we are going to choose the breathing apparatus level of protection offered by the respiratory protection equipment what kind of level is it is offering and what kind of level of protection we are required presence or absence of oxygen perhaps we don't have oxygen perhaps we are having the oxygen based on that we will be selecting then duration of the time that it must be worn 15 minutes 10 minutes 30 minutes 45 minutes in that way then compatibility with other items of ppe if i am wearing the cylinder i am wearing the full full face respirator then what about my helmet under the ppes is it compatible with that yes or no if i am wearing the uh, spectacles then what about that shape of the user's face facial hair like I, now i cannot go to the rig side because i am having the beard okay physical requirement of the job depends physical fitness of the wearer how much you are fit so yes because these are the factors sometimes you cannot wear it so you cannot use it so you cannot do that job for example so in in these these are the scenarios these are the factors we have to consider before we are going to select use of uh, select and use of uh, breathing apparatuses or respiratory apparatus and uh, here when we are going to use it users should understand how to fit the respiratory protective equipment by the way there is a specific training regarding that okay especially how to use it properly how to fit it on you and how to perform the fit testing how to test it to ensure that it is working effectively the user should know the limitation of the item how long it will be running or how much it will be protecting you any cleaning requirements if there are any maintenance requirement for example how to change the filter how we are going to change it we should know so these are the requirements we should know about them next is other personal protective equipment because we are till now focused on the respiratory protection or the inhalation protection okay what about the hand protection for example gloves gauntlets then chemicals biological agents physical injury would be there so we have to protect our hands so the chemicals should not be getting inside our body through some kind of skin cuts or uh, some kind of physical injuries what about the eye protection like spectacles goggles visors we must use them so that these should not chemicals should not be getting splashed into our uh, eyes and cannot get enter into our uh, body what about the body protection like overalls which we com commonly call them coveralls apron whole body protection what about them we must be pro protecting our whole body in including the safety boots even we have to wear so uh, other personal protective equipment we must use along with the respiratory protection so that we should not be letting the uh, chemical get inside our body next is very important thing whatever the pp you are going to use 
whatever the respiratory equipment you are going to use whatever the elimination substances dilute ventilation a b c whatever you do very important thing is about personal hygiene if you are washing your hands or not once you are dealing with the chemical after that are you going to wash your hands or not then careful removal and disposal of ppe to prevent cross contamination of the normal cloth the chemical was splashed on your coverall the chemical was splashed on your respirators you are removing your gloves in a way that you are touching your gloves you are removing your ppe now the chemical is being stick to your hands and then you are going to go for eating drinking and smoking so of course this chemical will go inside your body so we need to prohibit the eat, uh, the eating drinking and smoking in the work areas washing facilities must be provided changing facilities must be provided resting and food preparation areas should be segregated separated so that we can prevent the cross contamination sometime chemical does not get into your body directly but it gets in indirectly into your body in these ways next is we can have the vaccination of our workers to protect them just like we were having the covid vaccination against biological agent for example hepatitis b tetanus typhoid or covid even but important thing is worker consent is required like when you were using the sehati app for the covid vaccination you were mentioning over there that if you are uh, diabetic or not i mean if you are having some heart disease or not like you were giving them your consent okay then immunity not always achieved maybe you don't have anything with uh, i mean you got vaccinated but nothing you get sick again like in in the covid scenario we some of the guys they even they even though they were vaccinated but still they got infected then next is false sense of uh, security like if i will be having it maybe i will be i mean different scenarios are there so that is why people may be having different thoughts about that so we can go for the vaccination but these are the factors we need to consider next is the health surveillance finally it comes to uh, the health surveillance or you can say the administrative control health monitoring is required look for any kind of signs and symptoms symptoms of disease for example bakery workers have lung function test to check as them up because floor dust is a respiratory sensor sensitizer for all those who are working in the bakery areas or in the kitchens they must be having their lung function test so that if asthma is there you can identify that in the same way biological monitoring would be there look for the contamination in the blood urine or breath these regular tests should have been conducted lead in the blood for a uh, lead worker who is working closer to the lead then a screening on first employment you need to submit a an mfc medical fit certificate at the time of joining to any project or workplace further control of uh, carcinogens and mutagens and as as the majors post states that adequate control has not been achieved unless the well has not been exceeded okay uh, if or until the well is not exceeded not reached over there you don't have and you don't need to have any or you cannot achieve any kind of control over there the eight principle of good practice have been applied you until you don't apply these principles these you cannot say that i am having enough control on the chemical agents or hazardous chemical agents or hazardous substances next is exwear is controlled to as low as reasonably practical we need to go for alarm so that we can control our exposure basically as low as much we can next is uh, in addition to standard control measures the following must be considered we must consider all these factors one of them is total enclosure of process or handling system if we can do that totally enclose that so that the chemicals or agents would be there whatever the biological or chemical agents would be there and we will be protected second prohibition of eating drinking and smoking in those areas regular cleaning warning signs safe storage handling and disposal and finally 
information training instruction and supervision should be given to the people who are working over there so it was our uh, fourth module that is ended now and uh, yes what did we discuss in this module in this module we had discussed the way we are going to protect ourselves what are the control measures starting from the need up to the principle of good practice we move to these factors what did we discuss we started eliminate uh, identifying elimination or substitution we move to the process change reducing the exposure time employer and segregation then we go for local exhaust ventilation we move to the dilute ventilation then personal hygiene and protection regime health surveillance we need to have that rest we understood the respiratory protective equipment and other pp so this is what we had discussed in this module if you are having any question please let me know otherwise we can end up now we are having one module that is about the specific agents okay in which we have to discuss asbestos okay and different forms of asbestos how it is reacting how we are going to control blood borne viruses like hepatitis b hepatitis c carbon monoxide cement legionella bacteria and leptos uh, leptospira bacteria and silica and finally wood dust these are some of the topics we have to discuss if you agree we can dis we can take a break we can discuss it after the break otherwise we can end up now and one time we can start it because today is thursday so we will be adding it with our next topic that would be uh, on saturday so as you say okay sir no issue what is no issue mention if you that. want we can end up if i want okay mahmood <laughs> said clear message mahmood gave clear message that is saturday very nice mahmood i like that clear message should be given come on everyone send the message saturday saturday Saturday. Okay, fine. I am having how many participants? I am having twenty participants, including me. So nineteen messages should be there. Saturday, inshallah. Saturday, Saturday. Very nice. So most of the guys they have Saturday. Okay, guys. So I think this is enough. Okay. Uh, so let's end up now. Enjoy your weekend and see you inshallah on Saturday. And on Saturday, Saha Alam said we can finish now. Huh? okay on saturday uh, we will be starting from the specific agents then we will be moving to our chapter number 8 which would be perhaps the longest chapter of your uh, whole study and we will be dividing that chapter we had to divide that chapter in two days so we will be uh, by the way studying that on saturday so for now have a nice weekend guys goodbye and Yes assalamu alaikum and goodbye bye bye